Shall we get started? I think when you're giving a seminar at your own department, you get to introduce yourself. Uh, but you don't have to, because all of you know me. Um, there, exactly, there you go. Um, OK, so I'll spend the, the next um, 50 minutes to an hour um, talking about this paper that Jiang Ho and I have written together, part of a line of work that we've been pursuing, um, that we think is very interesting. This is part of a broader line of work that is very much at the heart of some of the discussions and controversies here in the department about the applicability and caveats uh, of using methods from information theory in economic analysis. I thought that, that, that I would use this presentation as a little bit of a cheat in those debates and bring all sorts of methodological points and all range of issues to do with, with how I think we can apply these methods, but that would take me about three hours. And even I would get bored of my own voice after about an hour and a half of this. So I'll try and focus on the substance of this paper only. Uh, there's clearly uh, a broad range of issues that are posed by the discussions of the paper. People should feel free to, to ask uh, questions or make interventions, and we can uh, pursue those discussions um, then. So I'm, I'm just going to start talking about this very um, uh, interesting pattern that we found uh, in distributions of profitability uh, and how the paper is arguing we can try to understand those distributions as an economic outcome. So I'll do this in about four parts. I'll say a few things about the distributions. I'll situate um, the contribution that the paper makes in relation to previous contributions, but then also uh, basically it's, it's analytical pillars. Uh, I'll do all of that without a single equation. And then I'll give people some sense of the mathematical derivation, which is at the end of the day somewhat secondary to the conceptual underpinnings of the argument that's being made. Okay? The distribution themselves are, uh, are very interesting. What we were able to measure was, uh, well, we were able to measure things because we use this database that has very, very uh, densely populated um, data sets of individual enterprises across Europe. We looked at annual end of year distributions for 10 years, 06 to 2015. Um, these are very, this database contains a very large and fairly representative sample of the economies in question. Um, uh, businesses of all sizes, 99% of the companies in the database are not, not incorporated, they're private. Uh, we ended up looking at 20 European economies uh, and we selected those that had on average more than 3,000 entries per year. As it turns out, um, the ones that across this threshold actually go quite a bit higher. And on average, we have about 150,000 enterprises per country year in these distributions. For some of the bigger economies, Italy, Spain, and France, there are more than 400,000 observations per year. So very, very densely populated uh, histograms that we have been able to construct on the basis of this. And we are looking at a uh, 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 fairly uh, straightforward measure of return on capital, EBIT, to total fixed assets. Qualitatively, the findings that, we, that I'm going to discuss don't change when you use other measures in the denominator. Well, yeah. Um, why not non-answer? Um, we've done that, and the, the, the findings are, are equi qualitatively equivalent. The distribution gets a bit fuzzier because you probably get into issues of cash flow management, inventory manage management, and work in progress management that where these, these regulations don't, don't bear upon so uh, starkly. So when you look at this, hmm? er EBIT, uh, earnings, earnings before interest and taxes. Right? So before you start divvying out uh, uh, basically market-derived uh, profits across the different constituencies uh, that are going to take a bite uh, at the apple. So it's the closest thing to the market-generated uh, rate of return on fixed uh, assets. And when you plot these histograms, uh, it turns out that there is this distribution, stretched exponentials, that fit the data remarkably well. And I will try and give people a sense of what I mean by remarkably well, because it really is remarkable. The stretch exponential we can talk about later, you can think of it as a simple generalization of the regular exponential. It has an extra parameter in it, and we can relate that parameter to something that, to which we can attach economic significance, as it turns out. 
thanks in no small part to, in fact, thanks completely to the work of uh, Hanel and Thurner over the past uh, six, seven years. So if you look at the distributions of X, basically deviations of this measure of profitability from its modal value, this is what you get for all of these countries. I'm going to show you a number of these uh, plots. This is France and Italy. What you have is log frequency on the vertical axis, and then what you have is deviation from mode. And you have the stretched exponential fits. Uh, France and Italy, Sweden and Portugal, Belgium and Germany, Spain and the Czech Republic, and R Romania and the Ukraine, and there's 10 other countries, but uh, the graphs all kind of look like this. Okay? Uh, perhaps more, more significantly, when you actually estimate the information distinguishability index, uh, between the fits and the actual data, you get some fairly compelling numbers. You, we have this plot uh, in the paper, people can look at it. But the average fit on the right tail uh, is well in excess of 0.99. In other words, more than 99% of the informational content of the distribution is captured on average. The maximum power is often 0.999 with another nine um, afterwards for some economies. Um, on the left tail, things are still pretty good. You're, you're dealing uh, with indices in excess of 98% uh, percent on average, often in 0.99. There is a reason why the fit on the left-hand side um, is slightly inferior. We can talk about that towards the end of the, or during the discussion. But these are pretty compelling numbers, right? We're reporting here average uh, measure of goodness of fit by the Sufi uh, index, and then the minimum measure of fit in other words, in all of the 10 years, wh how, what's the worst performance of the model? And you have it up here. And even the worst is pretty darn good. OK. Why is this significance? Well, it's significance, first of all, because you have a strikingly simple and fairly general cross-country pattern that appears over and over again in data. That in itself is interesting. What's also interesting, of course, is that um, Individual measures of profitability are fundamentally interdependent, right? We know that enterprises realize measures of profitability that depend on the profitability of others. People may be competing in the same output market. People may be comp competing in the same input markets, right? So you have these kind of local interdependencies between individual measures of profitability. But you also have longer range interdependencies of profitability. Everybody is capturing a chunk of aggregate demand. People don't think about this very often, right? That creates interdependencies between a re 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 the relatively successful enterprise and less successful ones, right? And more relevant to our present discussion, there are long-range interdependencies that are created by the fact that capital is mobile. That capital will tend to move from low-yielding to high-yielding uh, allocations just as a reflection of self-interest and competition, right? So you're getting a robust, persistent pattern, right, in the distribution for a quantity, the individual values of which are fundamentally interdependent. I underline this because it, 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 it already invites us to think that this is not some kind of central limit theorem type result that is uninformative. But it is actually something that is conveying to us something formal about the processes that regulate this quantity. Okay? It's also interesting because profitability is not like the price of tea in China. Right? If the price of tea in China had a robust distribution, that'd be very interesting. Right? Profitability is a central measure for this particular form of socioeconomic organization in which we live. Profitability, as we, some of us like to call it, is some measure of the self-expansion of the processes of capital. It is, in a very real way, a quantification of a wide variety of, of market interactions and, uh, that have social content. It's also something that informs the undertakings that will be supported and the undertakings that will not be supported within the system. So it's central to the functioning of this metabolism, if you will. And here I'm starting with the, with the biological metaphors. It will not be the only one that I'll throw out today. So we're observing here something very interesting. Um, I've, I've kind of jokingly put it, in as much as there's an invisible hand, well, we're kind of looking at it, right? 
in the sense that you have a spontaneously emerging pattern of organization arising unintentionally from the competitive actions of individuals. And that pattern is the same uh, for all of these economies. That's pretty cool. The content of the contribution. This is good. I'm doing pretty well, actually, time-wise, which is not my typical. I get excited. First, obviously, um, this work relates directly to two previous bodies of work that effectively started us thinking in these directions. Uh, one has, and, and you can think that these observations in this particular fit uh, that we report in the paper very much um, extends uh, and broadens the findings that these contributions have made. The first set of contributions are due to Alfarano uh, et al. Two papers starting in 08 uh, mentioned, but then the 2012 paper is the more comprehensive one, where they look at a, at a, a, a set of about of a 10 to the 2 uh, US non financial corporations and found measures of profitability to follow the subordinate distribution. It's uh, power exponential. This was followed by the work of uh, Scharfenacker and uh, Seminuk, 2016. Significantly greater uh, sampling of US non-financial corporations, 10 to the 3. And they find strong evidence supporting a particular member of the Subotan family, the asymmetric Laplace. Right? What we're finding is very much in this, in, in this line of findings. Um, the advantage that, that th this study has is just we considered a lot more firms across many, many other countries. And what we found is, broadly speaking, that what these original contributions found is reasonably borne out by what we observe. We're looking at 10 to the 5 enterprises uh, per year on average. And what we find is this double-stretched exponential, which can be understood as a subotan-like generalization of the regular double exponential that Ellis and Gregor uh, found, except that it has Again, courtesy of, of Hanel and Thurner, a uh, fairly, a much simpler economic intuition behind it than the Subotan, to which I'll get before the, the discussion is finished. Okay, so the paper makes some, it, some methodological contributions. It certainly makes a theoretical contribution. I'm not going to dwell on the issues of method. They, they, they are all uh, there, and we can talk about this. I'll just say a couple of things about what's at the heart of the model. Oh, the other thing too, uh, I'm not going to talk about um, the, the um, here, but we can talk in the discussion about the contributions that people have made as they have sought to explain these similar patterns. Alfarano and company, for example, put forward a drift diffusion model of individual evolution of profitability, which gives you at statistical equilibria uh, uh, um, subotan uh, distributions. Ellis and Duncan uh, gave us uh, an application of the quantal response statistical equilibrium. Um, the account that I'm going to give you actually is formally uh, very, very close to the QRSC, although it has a slightly different interpretation of, of what the actual processes are, the, uh, in, the processes involved in generating the distributions. But in the sense that fundamentally, all that we're observing in these distributions is a trade-off between pecuniary return and information. That is shared between uh, both frameworks, and I think that is the underlying insight of what's coming out loud and clear here. That in, 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 in this and in other self-organizing -organ systems, the functioning of those systems uh, price out hmm, uh, combinatorial information. And I'll, I'll try and substantiate that uh, uh, with a discussion on the model. Okay. What's distinctive about the account that the paper puts forward is that it's trying to give what, what I've been calling and, and saying over and over again to anybody who will listen, a systemic theorization. And this is actually, it reflects a certain stance on, on what kind of social inquiry we can do on the basis of that data. This is not a statement about the totality of social inquiry we can pursue. It's simply a, statement, a set of statements concerning the kind of social inquiry we can pursue on the basis of these kinds of annual data that lead, let us build these nice histograms, sometimes uh, showing us some pretty strong patterns of organization. So um, there are three foundations to this broad uh, view as it applies to this paper. And they draw from three uh, uh, literatures or, or, or um, traditions. Classical political economy, Austrian political economy, 
Ooh. <laughs> and information theory. We really need to mean it when we say pluralism. Critically, though you gotta mean it, especially if it tells you something you didn't know before, okay? A little reflection as I was looking at this and, and, and putting together these slides, I'm realizing that I'm getting old. Um, yeah, but most of you are looking at me going like, no shit. <laughs> um, I mean this in the sense that I, I, I'm becoming self-aware of the things that have influenced the way in which I think about these things. And there's actually a common thread between the contributions here that, that, is, that is important and not often appreciated. Um, I, I became an anti-positivist, and I was telling people in Historical Foundations this the other day. Um, really, uh, as a consequence of two people, Lenin and Hayek. And over very, very different terrains, what they are both invite, inviting us to think in social inquiry and in social pra praxis, actually both of them, is a keen understanding of agency and subjectivity. Which, if you are a research, means that thinking about what you know, what the subjects you're looking at may or may not know, and what you may or may not come to know about what they know or don't know, to get all Rumsfeldian, yeah? is of fundamental importance as you strive to understand the regularities that the functioning of social systems exhibit. That was a complete sentence in the English language. And information theory, and I realized I had this epiphany the other day, of course I would like James. Because James is an anti-positivist. James is something that is asking us actually to reimagine the entirety of probability theory as an epistemic exercise. Right? As a way to formalize the mechanisms through which we can come to logical conclusions inferred from what we observe. So I'm like, this, this is not an accident, right? There's, a, there's an intellectual um, suite here, and it actually has some bearing into the kind of story that the paper ends up telling. Okay? Thank you for the indulgence. So, classical. Well, the classical story I don't need to tell very much in this room because it's, this is like ground zero for this kind of story, right? Um, okay, so clearly these distributions are very strongly peaked, right? If they're strongly peaked, this is telling us you know, pretty convincingly that the rate of return at the peak can be understood as some measure of cost of capital. Cool, right? That's what's regulating the, the, the evolution of all of these rates of return, and it must be some cost. This is an economy after all. A capitalist economy, after all, profit-driven, differentials of rates are what animate um, uh, everything, so it must be a cost of capital. In classical political economy, we have this idea that, that Anwar will always remind you of, of the endogenous formation of a general rate of profit from capital mobility. A very simple movement from lower yielding to higher yielding tends to bring about a general rate that we can understand to define the opportunity, opportunity rate of return against which all rates measure themselves. Right? It's a, it's a disaggregated, atomized economy. You don't know what's going on, but when you realize a certain measure of profitability and you compare it to everybody else that you can see, you have a pretty good sense of how you're doing. And that informs actions. That informs the allocation of resources. That informs what happens or doesn't happen. So it's important. This idea of the endogenous generation of a, 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 an opportunity cost of capital or a general rate of profit um, led to this idea of understanding deviations from that rate as a socially scaled variable. And socially scaled variables, as, as I've put them, are interesting because while they are subject to very thorny nonlinear evolutions, because everything ends up being related to everything, under some fairly simple conditions, those can resolve themselves into simple aggregate statements, typically of the form of some constraint over some time horizon, over the first moment of the distribution of all of these values. I don't need to dwell on that here. What's interesting in this connection is that what we're dealing with is something that has come up uh, in work that Ellis and I have done, in the work that Oslem uh, uh, did in her PhD, is that in the formation of this opportunity cost of capital, you realize that in these distributions, they are right skewed. Meaning that the average rate of profit is actually bigger than this thing that is regulating. Right? The measures of profitability. Meaning, and I'm going to wave my hands a lot, broadly speaking, that in the endogenous process of formation of what capital market players come to believe is typical, they end up at a rate that is smaller than the average. 
meaning that they are in effect discounting in some way, shape, or form higher rates of return in their formation of what they come to believe is typical. Now, the answer to, as to what's going on there is actually quite simple, right? Because one could say that the reason that this difference exists is that there are some type of entrepreneurial quasi-rent in, in the higher rates of return that individuals accept and observe but understand that they're not really typical because they are associated either with innovation, which I cannot readily replicate if I'm an out outsider, or it might be that, they're, that it's just risk premium, that it's just less likely that people will engage in some undertakings, and by virtue of that uh, uh, lower supply because of risk aversion, you end up getting these higher rates. In either uh, event, you end up with a differential that you can associate to some measure of temporary dynamic quasi-rent attendant to some kind of entrepreneurial behavior. Okay, And I do want to entertain that, because I think we can tell stories that are interesting and capture, I think, something about reality. So that's the first pillar. The second pillar is Austrian. And what do I mean by this? Well, most generally, I mean what I've called here um, epistemological modesty and a certain understanding of what the outcomes of the competitive, oper the competitive operation of the market process are. Couple of things. According to the Austrians, we can neither observe nor characterize the details of individual competitive actions. Why? Because individual competitive actions are defined by subjectivities and time and local time and place knowledge that is just not accessible to us as observers. Perhaps more importantly, people don't get their way. You can, people make plans, but the reality is that people's trajectories dynamically over historical time are disequilibrium trajectories in the sense that they're not getting the outcomes they wanted. Right? So what you're likely to observe was you observe a whole bunch of individuals, you're overwhelmingly likely to observe a whole bunch of people with realizations at variance with their plans. Hayek taught us that. And then of course taught us that the price system is something that can create signals that tend to reduce the measure to which those deviations actually take place. Because individuals are alert and they're always looking for opportunities, which means that there is a kind of knowledge that we can obtain at the aggregate level that emerges spontaneously from the competitive operation of alert agents operating in a system where prices can convey information from one place to the other without people having to know everything. That is in the back of the story that the paper is telling. And it's, it's doing this in a very specific way. Before I tell you what the specific way is, I need to point out that there's two different kinds of competitive actions that we can consider uh, in the Austrian framework. There are competitive actions that we can call entrepreneurial or innovative. Somebody comes up with a new way of doing stuff. Okay? To the Austrians, that's very important. Today, people that take many courses in business schools talk about the disruptors, right? And all sorts of uh, business school ease. Well, it's these people. The other kind of, of competitive intervention, uh, we can, the paper's calling arbitrage, some people may not like the term, uh, but it's emulation. Moving capital and competitive e efforts and resources towards existing undertakings that are yielding more than what you're doing. But they exist already, okay? Now, by definition, the outcomes of entrepreneurial action are like a box of chocolates. You never know what kind you're gonna get. Because it's innovation. You don't know the subjectivity and the processes through which the entrepreneur went, and you don't know a priori what the results are, be, are going to be, so you cannot really read backwards. But there's something that you can uh, postulate about the outcome at the aggregate level of the actions of arbitrageurs or the people moving capital, which is this. Whatever happens, if you have a, a minimal measure of Entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial alertness in the economy, and you have a price system in capital markets that do convey information effectively across individuals, we should expect to observe outcomes at the aggregate level of the actions of these arbitrageurs that reflect an emergent aggregate reckoning of the returns that they raise with the costs that they faced. In other words, we can expect the competitive interaction and competitive actions 
mediated by capital markets of arbitrageurs, basically to cost out the returns that they generate through their actions. Okay, That is going to inform the model that is being put forward in the paper. Become clearer, hopefully, in about 10 minutes. And last but not least, information theory. OK. The key idea, there's two ideas that come in, but really the one that I'm, well, I'm excited about both of them, but I get excited about all sorts of things. The first one that I got really excited when I, when I stumbled upon it, um, and, and, and Junko and I went through a whole bunch of discussions on this, and then on the second one, too. It was an exciting summer. Um, is this idea of an informational accounting. See, this comes from theoretical biology. It's a paper in the mid-1980s by somebody uh, called Wicken. And then Smith had three papers in the Journal of uh, Theoretical Biology in 2008 that basically advanced a very interesting way for us to try and understand the functioning of complex systems capable of self-organization. And the idea is basically this. If you want to try to gain some measure of understanding about the functioning of a self-organizing system, cool, good for you. <laughs> what can you do? Well, one thing that you can do is effectively attempt to understand the dynamic evolution of the entropy for a distribution that is central to the functioning of a distribution for a quantity that is central to the functioning of that system. Figure out what processes in the functioning of the system organize the distribution, find out what processes disorganize the distribution, and ask yourself, most importantly, what are the requirements or costs of organization? This, this will make sense, I promise. Just bear with me. In an economic system, what organizes distributions of profitability? Well, we already said it's the actions of these arbitrageurs. You can think of arbitrageurs who are moving capital from low yielding to high yielding, right, as people that are effectively generating profits out of heterogeneity. If there's no heterogeneity, there is no arbitrage profit. Okay, collectively, the arbitrageurs are a little bit like the Maxwell demon. They eat entropy. And not because they want to do this esoteric thing called you know, consuming entropy, but because it's how they make money. By moving from low and going to high, you tend to concentrate the distribution in a manner that reduces entropy and tends to organize the distribution of profitability. OK. Second point that's perhaps more importantly, because reductions in entropy for systems uh, with 10 to the 5 members are preposterously unlikely to occur spontaneously, we can suppose that the effect on the distribution of profitability of any action that doesn't have it in its fundamental nature to reduce entropy, the result of that action will be to increase entropy. Unless you have an economic intervention that has in its fundamental nature right, to reduce entropy, like the, 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 the pursuit of profits that are defined by heterogeneity, then you should expect the action to increase entropy. OK, which means that we need, as we try to understand the pattern of organization that we observe, we should do it with reference to the economic calculus that is animating the actions of arbitrageurs. OK, now to do this, we're going to have to characterize the aggregate revenues and the aggregate costs that arbitrageurs face when we can't observe this stuff directly. To do this, we got to do some cool stuff, well, especially when we're trying to characterize the costs that arbitrageurs face. The, rev the, the revenues is, are actually easy to approximate. It's fairly immediate. But figuring out the costs that are posed by self-organization in a social system is tricky. You see, this idea of informational accounting in some ways can be understood to have been born with the contribution of Landauer, 1961. Landauer was trying to come up with a theoretical limit, the lower, the minimum possible cost that would be necessary to manipulate an information-bearing physical degree of freedom. He's basically trying to figure out is how little energy do we need at the theoretical limit to carry out computations, changing a, 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 a bit from 0 to 1. 
As he's doing this, he, of course, reached for the standard thermodynamic result that at statistical equilibrium, there is a known relationship between the derivative of um, entropy with relation to energy and inverse temperature. Right? In a physical system, the relationship between cost and reduction of entropy is broadly understood, the energetic cost. Okay? But in these distributions of profitability, we're not dealing with anything thermodynamic, at least not in its functioning. Obviously, everything is thermodynamic at some level, right? But in terms of the, the regularities that the functioning of the system defines and then is defined upon, they are non-thermodynamic. So it's not immediately obvious to us what are the costs of self-organization in an economic system. What are the costs that we face for organizing a distribution of profitability? So the paper offers a, a fairly simple but new argument that leads us to the conclusion that so long as self-organization is being performed by a large number of individual interventions, we can expect there to be a positive relationship between the amount of self-organization that takes place in any given period of time and the costs that arbitrageurs face as they attempt to pursue their uh, actions. And I'll show that formally in about 10 minutes. And there's broader applicability of this. Right, I said this, I said this, boom. OK, let's move on. The last point about information theory, of course, is this idea of the stretched exponential um, as, as, as distributions that are actually defined by a particular entropy functional, the 1D generalized entropy. People can ask me about it uh, at the end. This is not as spurious and as ad hoc as it seems. Um, it's uh, finally becoming clearer out there to more than a couple of people that what Hanel and Thurner have done recently, and, and, and even more recently they did a paper with uh, Marie Gelman further generalizing this, for further grounding this, they have given us uh, a, a conceptually sound way to think about all of these different entropy functionals and what they mean in terms of the functioning of all sorts of different systems. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk about it in as much as I understand it uh, during the discussion or any time. In fact, I start talking about this, you can get me to stop. OK, so those are the three pillars, which means that the distributions that we observe are really only telling us two things. Oh, I'm doing pretty well. OK. They reflect very little other than the fact that competition prices organization in the distribution of profitability in a way that I will show, and that in the formation of the opportunity cost of capital or the general rate of profit, um, there is social scaling that is shaped by the presence of entrepreneurial or quasi-rents, uh, resulting in returns that capital market players don't regard as terribly typical. High returns that people recognize but see, there's no way I can do that as well, in some measure. And that imposes that right skew on the distribution, that difference between the typical rate and the average rate. Okay, let's do some math. Piano. OK, so the broad setup. The cool thing about math is that you can cheat. So we have a complex economic system. Let's call its state at some point of time E. Whatever it is, we're going to call that state E. Right? And we can even index this by time and say, hey, E evolves somehow. There's E. Take that state of the economic system, and let's consider a subset of it. A small subset of it, but actually a very important one. Call this the distribution of profitability. Take all of possible levels of profitability, coarse grain that domain, right? populate it, you know, figure out the relative occupancy, boom, do your histogram, boom, have a vector, F. That is a partial description of the full-on state of the economy E. Except it's actually not as naive a subset or naive as a partial description as it seems in the first instance for the reasons that I said earlier, right? Because of the role profitability, both individual measures and the over, and individual measures in relation to the distribution as a whole, the role that they play in allocation and what they are telling us about the functioning of all sorts of markets in the economy. Okay, 
Second step, let's consider the dynamic evolution of the entropy in the distribution of profitability. This is the informational accounting idea coming from the theoretical biologists and, and indirectly from Landauer and, and company. OK, so let's look at that um, entropy and how it evolves over a time period, 0 and tau. Why not? Between time 0 and tau, we say the economy evolves from a state E0 to a state E tau. This is a profound observation yeah, about economic functioning. And as a part of that movement from E0 to E tau, the distribution of profitability moves from a histogram vector O that has an entropy SO, original, to a final distribution F with an, with an entropy S of F, or SF. OK? Again, we're not saying anything radical here. We, all we're doing right now, actually not even accounting, we're just calling stuff names. Now we're going to do some accounting. Over this period, we can understand the change in the entropy in this distribution that gives us a partial description of the total state of the economy. The change in that entropy can be understood, obviously, as the final entropy minus the original one. Right? Now, here's where things start to get interesting. That change can be understood as entropy created gross and entropy reductions gross or informational gains. Right? This is where the theoretical biologists are starting to pop up because they've done cool things with this. This is the entropy creation during the period zero tau due to irreversible processes, processes that don't organize, processes that disorganize the distribution, which is basically most things. And then you have informational gains. The result of a certain class of actions that tend to organize the distribution of profitability. And I've already told you what they are. This is not a mystery novel, right? This is the mobility of capital. These are these arbitrageurs. And the key insight here is that we can then attach to this part of the dynamic evolution a kind of behavior, a kind of behavior that takes place in competitive markets, the outcomes of which we can characterize economically. And then that lets us unravel the entire uh, 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 um, uh, model that accounts for the distribution. That's where we're going. OK, there's just a couple of steps in between. Bear with me. OK, so. We're considering a time period between 0 and tau, during which the economy goes from uh, you know, E0 to EF, and uh, uh, from state uh, of profitability vector 0, uh, O to F. And that is the change in entropy. And I've already told you this. Any generic action taking place in the economy during this period is overwhelmingly likely to increase entropy. It sounds like a tautology, but it is not. The only things that reduce entropy are the things that reduce entropy. Let me make the serious point. Um, the only economic processes that will reduce entropy are processes whose economic drivers ensure that they reduce entropy. If, if you're dealing with a process that in its, in, in its animating economic spirit, what drives it? What are people trying to do? Right. of necessity, you know for sure, results in a tendency to reduce entropy. Those are the only kinds of processes that you can count upon to reduce entropy, statistically. I mean, with a system with n in, in the 10 to the 5, the likelihood of an accidental entropy uh, decrease is preposterously small. I mean, you're dealing like uh, probability ratios in, in the range of 10 to the negative 44, back of the envelope on calculation, for very small. like. Uh, a 10 to the negative 3 decrease in entropy is, is, has that likelihood. So the only actions in whose economic nature, uh, only competitive actions that, that have in their economic nature to reduce entropy, reduce entropy. And this is what we've called arbitrage or emulation that is driven by profits that are defined by entropy, that are defined by heterogeneity. So you pursue them until there's less, right? Profit seeking is like the monkey that keeps scratching himself. Yeah? They'll continue until they can't. Yeah? It's, it's the nature of the beast. All right. So, in the dynamic interaction between all sorts of things happening in the economy, there's innovation, there's policy changes, there's labor market, anything you want. And these arbitrage actions 
It is the latter, the arbitrage actions, that give the functional form to the distributions we observe. Everything else is adding what we like to call noise. OK, cool. Anybody that is pursuing, that is either exiting a, a relatively low yielding undertaking or anybody who is entering a relatively high yielding undertaking. Anybody that is basically making a profit out of the fact that there are differences in profitability by moving capital. But that's the purpose of stuff. Isn't it? That's, that reduces entropy. Right. But who's doing the other stuff? Everybody else. People innovate. They try to come up with a new product, or they even just doing the same thing as before. Any the, the part of what's being part of what the, these kinds of um, of um, explanations rely upon is the fact that um, basically can pretty much count on everything increasing entropy, unless you have a very good reason to think something decreases entropy. Right. The, Let's, let's go. Um, OK, OK, OK. I said this. I said, oh, come on. I really rewound too much. Sorry about this, guys. You do fancy slides, and you know it's too clever by half. OK, so here we go. We're going to get to the right. So the idea is that we can account for the pattern of organization with reference to the economic calculus that results from competitive, the competitive interactions that shape the undertaking of these reallocations of capital. Right? If you can account for that, and you can account for that in a way that gives you some, some way to, the, to, to match what you observe, you, you, you are in, you're in a good place. Okay. And you end up with an understanding that competition in capital markets and the price system in capital markets imposes an aggregate trade-off between the returns that arbitrageurs realize and the costs that they incur during that period. And we can talk about that in a second. So now we need to characterize the returns and the costs. As I said earlier, the returns are easy to characterize. Why? Because if you have a distribution like this, very peak, and you know that the middle is some measure of the opportunity cost of capital, then the distance from that rate and whatever rate you have is some measure of the return you can realize if you reallocate a marginal unit of capital from the off mode position back to the mode. So put an absolute value, and that is a measure of the return. Take the expected value of that distance across the entire system, and you have an average measure of the foregone arbitrage return at any given point in time. In this case, at the end of the period zero tau. So if you look at the, and tau is the period at which we observe. So you observe the distribution at time tau, take your observation, cool, and you look at it. There is within that distribution, at a certain level of abstraction, a latent arbitrage return that would be realized if everybody invested in line with those realizations and then let everything to collapse into a single rate of return. And the measure then of the foregone gain is simply the expected value of the absolute value. So we are going to think that Competition in capital markets tends to ensure that effectively the collection of arbitrageurs at the aggregate level would like to minimize that. But not absolutely, because every time you try to pursue one of these things, you face costs. These are transactions costs. These are costs to do with risk, a variety of costs, the details of which we don't know, and that creates some difficulties as we try to characterize them. Right? So we have the revenues over this period as being inversely proportional to this end of period uh, uh, distribution. And now we'd like to characterize the costs. And how much time have I got? Um, OK, I'll try to be quick. Uh, there is math, but it's actually really simple. What's the idea here? Once we realize that the only thing that reduces entropy are competitive actions that have it in their economic nature 
to reduce entropy, you can ask, you can ask yourself, well, what is the total cost of the, all the arbitrage operations that took place in this period 0 to tau? Well, it's basically going to be the sum of all of these operations. Right here, we'll break it down instantaneously. That's what you have in the sum. The little a at the top is the number of interventions, whatever, blah, blah, blah. The point is, it's a lot of them. I'm getting very technical now. The cool thing, if there's a lot of them, is, and we know this, so long as the average cost of each operation is bounded, the law of large numbers guarantees us something very nice, right? Namely, that the sum is going to be the number times the average, tendentially. Meaning that the more operations you undertake, the higher the cost. Tendentially. Cool? Make the same argument now for the contribution to entropy reduction. I don't know, right? Say I borrow at the going rate, say it's 3%, the current uh, um, opportunity cost of capital. I borrow at 3% and I go pursue a 20% return in some hot startup industry or whatever the hell. And I go do it. I'm not doing it to organize the system, right? But tendentially, I am tending to bring that high rate of return down. Tendentially, I am, I am, I am helping uh, generate gross entropy reductions. Yeah? But I don't know. Certainly, the, the economic agent is not even interested in this dimension of the problem. And we as observers have no way of knowing what they do and what its effect on organization is going to be. But we can posit along lines similar to this, and I have in the next slide, that so long as the average contribution of any individual arbitrage action to gross informational gains is bounded, a large number of such operations will result in a positive association between the total informational gains raised between zero and tau and the number of arbitrage operations taking place. Put the two together and what you end up with, a very simple statement that whatever the costs are, aggregate of all of the arbitrage operations that took place between zero and tau, they are rising on the amount of informational gains generated by those actions, statistically. Or they're overwhelmingly likely to be rising. So we can postulate some cost function that's, that's rising on informational gains. We don't know what the cost function is. We're going to assume it's convex. <laughs> but, or we actually don't even have to, but it doesn't matter. But you know, if they do it, we can do it sometimes. Fuck it. Pardon, did I say that? Okay. Blah, blah. So once you have that, this is what you end up with. You end up with a characterization of the result of the actions of arbitrageurs that appears as an optimization problem. And the idea follows from this. The total arbitrage cost and total informational gains are rising. Oh, no, I just said this. And total arbitrage costs are, are increasing on informational gains. Sorry, wrong slide. Here we go. So you can summarize this by positing that there, is, there, there are costs. If you want to organize the distribution, you face pecuniary costs over a time period that are increasing on the amount of organization that you actually affect during that period rather unintentionally, right? Just by moving from low to high. Cool. Um, but what are the informational gains in this period zero tau? Well, I'm just rearranging things that I showed before. And this is an important point in the story. I have the entropy that I started the period with, plus how much entropy is created, minus how much entropy I ended up with. That's how much gross reduction took place during the period. Right? This is just accounting. These two I can call uh, uh, capital theta. And why do I do that? Because these two, according to the schematization in the model, are not something that the arbitrageurs affect directly. This is something that is given to them. It's the result of other people's actions. It's the result of the everything else. And the SF then, right, appears to be the result of their actions. And a bunch of other things, but the result of their actions. So we can put that, right, in the characterization of the optimization that is created by market competition. Let me make this point again. Go back to the Austrians. We are simply supposing that the competitive outcome of all of these emulative uh, arbitrage relocations of capital is going to embody some kind of costing, 
some kind of uh, 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 reckoning of how much revenue people realize in doing these things with the costs that they undertake. Right? Put it differently. If during this period there was some arbitrage opportunity that people could have profitably undertaken, i.e., they would have realized more money than what it would have cost them, we assume that they've done it. And that sounds so Austrian, it's not even funny. <laughs> Actually, it sounds Fama-like. Right? This is Fama as the Austrian. Uh, we've, we've talked about this. Um, but it works for me. So uh, the total cost of arbitrage, we divide the two tails. And, and the reason we can talk about this, because actually the dynamics, the competitive dynamics of entry and exit, when, of entry and of exit, are very different. If you're dealing with a regulation of profitability in the left tail, you have death. Um, uh, you have actually liquidation of capital, right? Second, second hand markets for, secondary markets for capital goods are notoriously not very good, right? There's a variety of, of structural differences involved in the removal of capital from something and the allocation of new capital to other things. So you, you allow the two to be different and Bob's your uncle, as we like to say. And what you do is you think of the end of period distribution then simply as something that is shaped by the uh, competitive calculus um, that informs the outcomes of the actions of arbitrageurs, the balancing of arbitrage revenues and arbitrage costs. Right? So we can formulate this mathematically in this nice thing. What do we have here? We're saying that the, the final distribution, the end of period distribution, can be decomposed into you know, inframodal and supramodal left and right tails. And it is going to embody what competition imposes, which is a minimization of the aggregate losses that the arbitrageurs face, which is a funny way of saying they maximize the profits right, given by revenues and costs. The, the revenues, the, these are foregone earnings, so negative of revenues. These are the two costs that you face for organizing gross the distribution over this period. Then you have the first moment constraint that arises from the formation of the opportunity cost of capital and some normalization constraints. And add water, mix. And so long as the entropy functionals that you're using are these Hanel Thurner 1D uh, functionals, which look like this. OK, blah, 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 blah. you get stretch exponentials as the solution to this problem. Um, I can say more about these uh, uh, generalized functionals uh, during the discussion uh, and, and what, it, what, what they mean. The D, by the way, parameter that arises in all of this is actually very, very interesting. What Hanel and Thurner did is that they actually showed that, OK, I started, so I'm going to take the five minutes. Look, for a long time in, in various thermodynamic discussions, people kept throwing up new entropy functionals. And you'd ask them, why? Why are you using this entropy functional? And they would basically tell you, oh, because it works. And that created a lot of confusion and quite rightly a lot of frustration. Uh, what are the, ba I mean, yeah, it works great, but what does it mean? And what they have done is actually given us a unified framework that actually situates uh, almost all of these entropy functionals as special cases of a general class of entropy functionals called CD entropies. And what the C and D parameters capture are measures of strong interdependence or strong interaction in the functioning of the system in question. So that if you have d equals 1, you're back in the Shannon universe. But if d is greater than 1, what you have are strong interactions in the system that basically reduce the overall measure of the face, of the face space relative to what it would be in a Shannon uh, 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 world. I have some things in the appendices that can flesh this out if people want. But if you use these, where the D then is giving us a me an informational measure of interdependence, you get the, the distributions that fit the data quite nicely. Um, and one thing, the last kind of technical thing I wanted to show people, you set up the Lagrangian and you end up with something that I just realized last week that's pretty cool. So you have, here you have basically the loss function of the collective of arbitrageurs. 
And here you have the term that comes from quasi-rents. B is the average measure of quasi-rent in the economy. Meaning that gamma is actually an interesting quantification of the trade-off between, of the competitive trade-off or, or redistributions of surplus value between innovators and emulators. It's kind of cool. I wasn't planning on making a big deal out of it, but it's just kind of, it has a ready interpretation. And when you're like, range multipliers have something that sounds economic, I think, I, I think you're, you're doing okay until you're proven to be wrong. And then somebody else is more okay than you are. But that's, that's the name of the game, as we discussed the other day. Okay, I'm, I'm going to wrap up. We have the stretch exponentials, and they look really ugly when you put them like this. But when you plot them, they're beautiful. Okay? Part of the difficulty with these functions is that you see the M that comes from the, the Lagrange multiplier and the normalization constraints. They don't come out. When you, when you solve for the normalization constraint, you can't uh, get a partition function. And, and I thought that was a bug, but it turns out it's a feature. And it has to do with the, the, the dependence on scale that these uh, uh, um, functions are grappling with. Uh, we actually had an exchange with the people that first did this exercise, um, where we, we were able to flesh this out. And, and we're very happy to, to find out that using the implicit, implicit definition of the M from the normalization is the only way you can do it. So we're like, OK, cool. We're, we're on track. When the people who came up with something tell you that what you've did is exactly as much as you can do, that's very reassuring, especially when you know that you're way out there, off on a limb. OK, blah, blah. I don't need slides. I can wrap it up. Yeah, cool. So, so you have this model. What does this model tell us? It actually is asking us to think about these distributions um, as the result of things that are actually quite simple from, the econ from an economic standpoint. They are reflecting, one, the existence of quasi-rent, quasi-rents, i.e., that in the competitive regulation of profitability, there are some undertakings that are just not accessible or deemed typical. And that ensures that there is a slant. Actually, for you guys, a slant. Okay? That there is a difference between what is average and what is typical. Cool. What it's also saying is something that is actually implicit in the Corsi as well that what we're observing is a, a manifestation of a trade-off. In this case, a trade-off that is being defined competitively in capital markets between the returns that the people whose actions organize the distribution realize and the costs that they face as they pursue the profits that they can realize by organizing the distribution. That's it. And that's pretty cool. It's also cool because it, it points in at least two interesting uh, uh, directions. And I'll, I'll just conclude with, with those um, two perspectives. One is that th this approach of, of dealing with um, distributions defined over social symbolic things like profitability, i.e. non-thermodynamic, non-physical, and, and attempting to characterize cost of organization there when you don't have the well-established thermodynamic statistical equilibrium relationships. This basic idea that if you have a system, complex, self-organizing, whose functioning can be understood to proceed guided by the minimization of a moment of one of its, of its state, and if self-organization is actually the result of many, 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 many individual processes or many instances of the same process, sometimes the simple knowledge that over any given period of time, informational gains are going to be positive, positively related with the costs of these processes that are organizing can actually help us understand the functioning of that system. And that was not quite a full sentence in the English language. And I'm thinking here, obviously, of, 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 of things like uh, um, the, 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 the cognitive agents that, that colleagues have considered uh, under the Corsi, or things like um, Christopher Sims and rational inattention, that these are all instances of, of an underlying reality, that you have these systems that function. And in their functioning, they're trying to minimize some moment of some measure of, it, of their states. But that imposes costs. Why? Because ruling out phase space volumes is difficult. And if you want to rule out more, you're going to do, have to do more of the thing, the phenomenological thing, that reduces phase space volumes. 
that creates costs of organization that then get traded off against the objective of the system. Right? So all of these distributions that we're going to observe can simply be an expression of the resulting pricing, as we call it in economics, of that interaction. The final point is a point that is really uh, um, Farjun and Makovers in the first instance, but, but Duncan has made this point and others have made this point, but I think it's really important, is that even though I didn't talk about um, uh, uh, entropy maximization here at all, the paper doesn't do it, but obviously for those of you who know this uh, kind of work, the problem that we solved here is dual to an entropy maximization problem, meaning that the distributions that we observe can be understood as statistical equilibria over some phase space using a certain uh, entropy functional and all that happy stuff. Meaning what? Meaning that we can understand distributions of profitability as statistical equilibria. And this is cool and should shape our understanding of prices. You see, a lot of, of, of there are different conceptualizations of price out there, right? Different traditions of thought have predicated uh, what they understand as prices on different regularities. And here we are at this question with at what level are the regularities that we can predicate our understanding on. Well, Rayesian prices, general equilibrium. Every market is in equilibrium. That's your price factor. Yay. Great as a thought exercise. OK, maybe not. But, but fair enough as a thought exercise. The moment you attempt to throw that at uh, uh, observations, you are going to bump into problems. You have absolutely no guarantee. You'd need every market to be approximately in equilibrium. Classical political economy and, and Ricardian approaches took a different route. They said, look, you know, there's a more general regulation that is actually established by the mobility of capital. And if we understand this mobility of capital to result in a deterministic capital market equilibrium at a general rate of return, then we can construct a system of prices of production where we have a relationship between price vectors, wage vectors, and input-output relationships. Right? Farjan and Makover said that is an infinite improvement on the deterministic uh, goods market equilibria of the Laurasian system. But it still has this problem of the determinism. Right? So what they propose and what I think we can do now informed by, by, by empirical at a lower level of abstraction is conceive of the, the ways in which these statistical equilibrium characterizations of distributions of profitability can lead to statistical characterizations of the relationship between generalized prices of production, wage structures, and realized input-output relationships that we can then populate on the basis of what we observe. That's the, the, the ambitious kind of second iteration or third iteration even of this work. And with that, I promise you, I will shut up. Thank you. Okay. Really fascinating. It's exciting. I think all this uh, power um, relationship stuff is exciting um, because uh, I'm listening. It suggests that there's some kind of organization, um, and I'm excited for the reasons that one of us can come out of this once we start to understand what these power relationships mean better. So I'm excited to see there's some progress on that front. So. Uh, how, so I wanted to ask you about this, um, about the way that uh, your model deals with arbitrage and this, how uh, the assumption of, well, you know, the assumption of rationality and how, how important that is to interpreting the finding, the participant finding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I ask, do you want to, because I can, I, I think these belong together. Uh, in many ways, but should I take more, or should I? Yeah. Yes. But why would, why would you expect more innovation than imitation? 
Sure, but that also includes other things like somebody somewhere getting a raise. Sorry, let, 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 me, be, in other, let me put it. Th <laughs> I, I, I think the correct way to, 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 to go about this, and, I, and I'll take it back to, to um, what Alex was asking, is this. Um, organization is rare. Right? It doesn't happen by accident. I was talking to the, the um, historical foundations. I, I have, like, if I had you know, another life in 36 hours in the day, I'd be a science fiction writer. Or is it firefighter? I never quite know. But I have this image, right? So you, imagine you were landing in a new planet. Right? And you land in the, in the planet, and you arrive at some kind of cave. Could be a structure you don't know. Ooh, spooky. And there are all of these kind of bearing, kind of spherical things, about a million of them on the, on the ground. And they're all scattered all over the place. Well, you'd be thinking to yourself, oh, this is really interesting. I'm interested in the geology that would have produced all of these almost spherical things that are distributed equally around the floor. With me? Now imagine an alternative setting where you walk into that cave, and it's the same million, but they're all balanced one on top of the other perfectly, just there. Now you're thinking of an entirely different kind of explanation, right? You know, the hairs on the back of your neck start to stand up. Now imagine you walk in there, and instead you see them arranged in the model of the human DNA molecule. Then you're thinking intelligence, right? And there's almost an instinctive thing in this reaction, i.e. that we recognize that there are some configurations that are just really unlikely to happen by chance. And that if you observe them, there is something that has given rise to them. In, in, in the economic system, where there are as any range of conceivable measures of profitability that an enterprise can realize, right? A highly, highly organized, uh, or let me, a, 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 a decrease in, that in the measure of organization of the distribution of profitability is actually very unlikely as different things happen in the, in the economy, a priori, right? And when I said somebody getting a raise, meaning all sorts of things are going to happen between one year and the next that are going to have some chain of effects that will contribute to what arises at the other end. The only the only kind of intervention that we can rely upon to reduce entropy are the ones whose economic motivation is going to lead, we know, to reductions in entropy. Anything that doesn't have that within its economic oomph won't do it. Or at least it cannot be relied upon probabilistically, combinatorially, to do it. Yes? Correct. I have cornflakes. I never end up with a pork chop, much less a plate full of ball bearings. I mean, it's highly organized. And sure. So, when, when you're talking about organization being rare, it seems like in the social sphere it's everywhere. I mean, that raise, for example, very often that would be part of a contract that's negotiated in advance. And if it's not that, it's a convention. But somebody's decided that inflation is about 2%, right. so hey, everybody gets, right. you know, payrolls go up by 2%. But let me put it a different way. Okay, so take any, any one of those actions. What is going to be the effect of the repetition of those actions on the profitability of business X? We don't know, right? Uh, we just know that combinatorially, if I observe the distribution of profitability becoming more organized, something did it. That begs for explanation. That is informative. There is a process that we can conceivably characterize that is doing that. Um, and the question is, what in the economic universe can do that? And in many ways, we've, we have, in classical political economy, been saying this, but in a less formal fashion for a long time. When we say, hey, capital mobility gives you the general rate of profit, you're actually making a, 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 a looser version of this argument. That, that seems fine. I, I, I agree with that, that the, the organization thing must be purpose and that it doesn't just right. happen. Right. I guess I'm just struggling with this. Oh, well, that's just me. Okay. Can I it, it, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So my fear, my yeah. worry here, yeah. thank you for this marvelous presentation, uh, which has helped me a lot to understand what Mm -hmm. this approach. But my fear is that we're still operating with a tautology, which is the idea that there are things
Mm -hmm. Of course, you can take any situation that you see and you can describe it, if you like, mm -hmm. in those terms as a contest of forces or factors in economic or social life, some of which raise and some of which lower entropy, if that's the thing that you happen to be interested in measuring and describing. But why someone should accept that as the appropriate, let alone the superior, explanatory framework, as opposed to merely a descriptive choice that one could adopt, which would moreover be tautological, is what I'm failing mm -hmm. to see. And mm -hmm. I think this is related to Marx's concern. Mm -hmm. There may be particular, uh, of course, uh, detailed debates we can have on what is entropy reducing and what is entropy increasing, but let us suppose we don't have those detailed debates and we agree on what is entropy decreasing, what is entropy right. increasing. It still doesn't, uh, to my mind, uh, necessarily uh, offer a convincing explanatory framework to the extent that it is tautological. Descriptive, yes, the descriptive possibility, but is it explanatory? Any what, sir? <laughs> no. <laughs> this is no, that, but that's a very good question, and it, this is all related. And I have a couple of answers, and not some answers. Look, um, there's a question that I think we don't consider very often when we're doing observational work in, in, in economic analysis, which is, what are the aspects of, individ, of individual agencies that we can hope to observe, that we can hope uh, to, uh, that will be evident in what we observe? Okay? One of the things that a whole line of different contributions to political economy uh, uh, point to that I appreciate, and this, these are people like Marx, Smith, Hayek, uh, Fama, uh, the, the list is rather long, is that actually it is not going to be every aspect of individual agency that turns up in the outcome because there are interactions, there are mediations, and there's also the question of frequency of observation, right? At what frequencies do we observe things? Well, in this case, annual. If we observe quarterly, that's awesome. Cool. So then what are you observing? You're actually observing the accumulation, the accrual of the consequences of a whole bunch of interactions over a time period, right? So even the things that you're observing for an individual are already have baked into themselves uh, outcomes. So that's one thing. One of the things that the, the Austrians ask us to think about, but not just them, also financial theory, is that there are some basic qualities of individual agency that we can posit turn up in the aggregate. Self-regard, a certain measure of alertness, uh, and very basic things like that. So that's in relation to Alex. You know, what is it about individual agencies that we can see? And what the story here relies upon is something very simple. People are alert, they're profit seeking, and then the system will tend to inform everybody that somebody somewhere found a really exciting opportunity without them having to know about that opportunity just because the prices went up a little bit. Here. And now I'm going to come back. Um, the issue of, uh, of telos, individual telos and outcome. Well, Telos is one thing, but you would need to be assured that what you want is actually what happens. Now, if you are my, my two-year-old stacking some blocks, right, and his goal, oh, I don't, I, I'm not even going to speculate about my two-year-old's goals, but apparently it's to build a big block of towers, right? That's organization, right? But even my two-year-old has trouble. Can he actually manage it? In a social system, you have a version of this problem. Just because somebody wants something doesn't mean that, they, that it will come into being. There is interaction. So the individual intentionality and its relationship to any observable form of organization is a very difficult question. And, and a part of what I'm doing, we're doing here by, by going to the Austrians is trying to avoid that entirely. And just say what emerges is a qualitatively sound uh, expression of, 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 of self-regard and alertness plus competition. Okay. So that's one. Um, the issue of tautology and explanation, I, I, I think I haven't had the time to think about all of this properly, and, and I was saving this for the, for the spring, um, because I think I suspect that some of this has to do with what do we mean by explanation. Um, uh, 
And I don't have a side. I mean, I'm still contemplating the different. It seems to me that when, when people are talking about explanation often, what, what we want, what we're looking for is actually to have um, some account for what happens within a system that is predicated on things that we can consider to be external to the system. Right? What happens in here is a manifestation of these other things. And these are our ultimate. Uh, and obviously, if one is minimally sophisticated mathematically, you can have different parameterizations, and you understand that reality is complex, and you can par parameterize differently. And you know, is that an explanation or not? It's just yeah, a different. Is that causation? Well, that's 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 a, that's a, that's a uh, in a complex system, causation gets tricky. Yeah, but the, the fact that the causes are external doesn't mean the explanations are. Sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. The fact that causes. Right. Or the right. system, uh, doesn't mean that the explanations are all external. Correct. I mean, if we want to understand Correct. how the automobile works, we, we need to talk about the internal combustion engine and all that. Right. right. Correct. Correct. And uh, the other thing that I'm grappling with is what do we mean by causation in a complex system? And that I'm not entirely sure of. No, he's, he's a, there's a kind of duality between explanation and causation. That if you have a, an explanatory mm -hmm. theory, it's going, to, um, it's going to help you understand causation, which I think is probably... The, 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 there is, there is uh, uh, I think... Again, and I'm uncertain, I'm still visiting these things. There is, I think, in most people's minds, an association of explanation with uh, intervention into and bringing into being certain outcomes, i.e., some, some notion of, of, of the causal chain. C control, which then presumes a certain understanding of the causal mechanisms. The difficulty, of course, um, we can talk about this. I'm loath to come out here because I have some tentative uh, ideas on some, of some of the difficulties that are posed. And, and it might be that the best that we can do is describe certain characteristics of the competitive outcomes to which we attach social significance because of our existence as partisans in the social process. And, and, and it might be that that's where, what, what we can get. And that's, not an, that's what I meant by a non-answer to a question. But that's where I'm currently at. In the sense that in as much as we can, through exercises like this, to arrive at some measure of understanding that, look, you know, all of these things that we don't observe happen. But since we know some basic, so we have some basic prior understanding of rationality and of the functioning of markets, we understand that at the outcome of all of this, here are some characteristics that tell us something about distribution, its relationship to technology, and who gets what in a social process. I think there is value, even if I cannot give you kind of a hard and fast um, um, explanatory account uh, uh, predicated on certain tractable parameters that could at least in thought be understood as separate from the functioning. Uh, uh, that's, and I'm, I wave my arms a bit because, as I said, big disclaimers, this is a uh, work in progress. Um, more. Well, <laughs> I had a more question because there are two different expressions in your slides that I didn't pick up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the average absolute x. The other way around. It's it's for, it's foregone. It's the average foregone arbitrage return. I think that's wrong. Why? Because you don't forego an arbitrage return by not moving away from a high profit to a lower profit opportunity. I don't understand. 
Right. To the left on that diagram is an arbitrage gate. Moving to the right is an arbitrage loss. Yes. Okay. Yes. But when you put the absolute value signs, you don't acknowledge them. No, you do. No. Because when you put the absolute value signs, you integrate, but you change the sign when you're moving on the right-hand side. Yeah, but what, what I'm saying, when you put the absolute value, the absolute value is a measure of this distance, or this distance. Yeah, ah, yes, but when it goes to the left, it's a loss. Yeah, but the movement is on the opposite direction. But, <laughs> okay, think about it, but it's actually, it's without the absolute value signs that no, but, but it's the, the same. The mean is there, and what it tells you in your language is that the, um, the net arbitrage opportunity, the opportunity cost, is just B. That's all. It's just those excess, uh, the, the things that make the thing skew. The quasi rent or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah but sure, but, but, but this is entirely analogous to, to the Corsi, right? I mean, what are, no. you trying, what are you trying to minimize? You're trying to minimize loss. The, no, in the Percy, everybody wants to move to the left. In that right? Nobody Wait. wants to move to the right. People want to move to the left? Always. No, everybody wants to move to the right. No one ever wants to move to the left. Correct. Correct. But. In the Percy. Yeah, but, you know, but see, I, know, I, under, I understand exactly. No, the difference is that these are not postulated as individual gains, they're postulated as social gains. Well, but I question why is there a social gain to moving capital from a high profit to a no. lower profit? No, 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 no. Because the, the expected value of, of the, this x here right, tells me a me measure of the marginal gain if I liquidate here and return here. That part is OK. But so the all other of, side, the other side. Exactly. This minus this absolute value is the same thing as this. No. No, when you move that capital from here to here. No, 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 I understand. It's when you move capital from here to here. When somebody raises capital at 10% and allocates it at 30, they're realizing a marginal differential of 20. Um, I... Fine. Okay. Okay. But. which would be an interesting measure of a certain dynamism in an economy. Absolutely. Indeed. Now, th that can be fleshed out with this data. We haven't done it. We've done something that approximates it. See, in, in, in earlier iterations, we had balance panels. But then you have survivor biases. But, but you can actually work backwards from that and actually populate that. That would be a very interesting uh, a, a, a measure of, of dynamism. Completely different. I mean, how quickly are f underperforming firms cold? And how quickly is competition creating underperformance? Those are different moments, indeed. Yeah. So just uh, one also slightly technical question. I'm not completely convinced mm -hmm. by the claim about goodness of faith. Yes. Which has been made in your paper today and other papers mm -hmm. as well. Is there a more rigorous statement of that beyond the visual presentation of the idea that the scatter plot uh, mm -hmm. looks as if it fits particular Indeed. Uh, functional form. For example, somebody calculated a mean squared error for, for this relationship. I know that, that people calculate, what's it called? The, 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 the KL divergence, yeah. So, yeah. But you know, that's not exactly a standard uh, measure used in the broader econometric or statistical literature. 
Indeed. So please convince us more comprehensively indeed. that indeed. it doesn't just look good. Right, indeed. It is good. That's one the, thing. Sorry. Please don't no, no, no. The, the, the KL divergence is precisely the basis for these, in, these indices. This is, um, well, actually, it's an exponential uh, of, of the KL divergence. The KL divergence gives you an informational measure of, of, of dissimilarity between two, two distributions that you can actually map into bits, uh, bits as in, as in computational uh, 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 bits. So Sufi and company came up uh, with, with this index that tells you how much of the uncertainty of one distribution, uh, your estimated distribution is capturing. And then these indices uh, report that as a percentage. It, this can be understood as a non-parametric generalization of, uh, of an adjusted R-square. Actually, it wouldn't be adjusted, of an R-square. Um, and that's, that's what we're reporting here. And that's the thing that is consistently, for the right tail, well above uh, uh, 0.99. In other words, um, only z less than 1% of the informational content of the observed histogram is not captured by the estimated uh, 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 function, stretch exponential. So could I ask a second part? Yes, of course. Suppose we accept that. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the empirical data right. corresponds in some remarkable way right, right, right. stretched exponential distribution. Mm -hmm. Now we want to explain the Correct. Mm -hmm. why that's the case. Right. Right? And we're presenting an mm -hmm. explanation of a kind, if we mm -hmm. for the moment call it that. Right? Which I an account, how about or a description? Uh, yeah. Which I understand to be, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that there is an entropy uh, reducing process going on, call it arbitrage, which is yep. uh, in contest with other processes that are going on, which are entropy increasing. And the specific micro characterization that you give to this entropy reducing process in terms of the nature of the costs and revenues generated by arbitrage will in turn give rise to a particular macro conclusion Quite. in terms of the specific function, not just functional form, but function that belongs to the family mm -hmm. that you are correct. Uh, That's correct. Uh, 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 focusing on here that will be generated. Okay? So there's a, there's a mapping from these micro assumptions about the revenue and cost of arbitrage to the macro conclusion of the specific function that will be generated. And that's, that's your theory, as I understand. That's the account, yeah. There could be, to bring in Anwar Sheikh, who's not here, uh, a more, um, a, a broader range of micro foundations that we might see, just as Indeed. we do in relation to the right? Quite. Uh, Quite. He does. Quite. We might ask the question, what other kinds of Indeed. behaviors could Indeed. potentially generate a stretched exponential macro behavior? Indeed. We presented one, yes. and that's a very valuable that's right. uh, contribution, but we might be interested in what other Think about that broader problem. I wouldn't call it a challenge. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is. There, there is. I mean, we, I think we're, we're we're kind of honing in realizing that it, it's not so much that we have differences. We're just approaching this from different angles. There, there is something here that is very different from the conventional practice of our most of our colleagues in economics. In, in that. This kind of analysis is very self-aware, it's self-conscious, and it presents itself as work in progress. And we need horse races, as, as Anwar would, would, would like to say. Now, within those discussions, obviously certain themes will arise. So one, one place that people go to as they attempt to, to explain uh, robust distributions is they, 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 they go to drift diffusion processes. So you characterize a representative evolution, you say that it follows some Ito process, and then uh, you use the Fokker-Planck equation, and then you can characterize the statistical equilibrium, in some cases, a uh, 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 shape. Um, I can say why I don't like that line of, of, uh, of explanation, because it's, individual, it's, it's actually representative individualism in, in a form, and it's not explicit, giving explicit place to the results of interaction. But, hey, put them all out there. I mean, to me at least, at least how I approach this is, if, if somebody comes around, and looks at this and, and believes that the fit is sufficiently close to warrant some time to try to provide an explanation, that, that's what I want. And for that explanation then to be better than this. Now, I, I, I do like to, to be able to show, and this is a value, but that's in line with James, that if it's something really simple, even if the math gets tricky, but un underneath it is something very simple like revenues versus costs. You know, 
there's some, we want that characteristic of answers, regardless of what the answers in, at the end end up uh, uh, being. I just realized what the disagreement with Duncan was, actually, and why it was sounding like we were both, or one of us, making a patent mathematical mistake. It's neither. And I'm saying this for the camera. He is thinking, because he is thinking it in terms of the individual who is trying to go higher. And I'm thinking of it as the result of, of a high rate of return that then comes back down because somebody went in there. That's why he sees a minus where I see a plus. I, I uh, whew. Uh, all around, actually. <laughs> see ya. I, I, I think I understand what you're saying, um, but that's not quite the process. Obviously, this is real world data, and in the real world, real things happen. So part of what's happening here is revaluations, right? So there is, um, uh, this has not been considered, partly because th th there's no rhyme or reason upon which to predicate such consideration. Uh, but there are revaluations that shape these things. Uh, so um, um, what we're considering is simply that um, there is a tendency for capital to leave low yielding and then to enter high yielding. The difference with the QRSC is actually, it's more to do with, with interpretation. It's certainly not mathematical. The mathematics are very similar. But in, in the QRSC for this um, exercise, you suppose that there is an agent who is informationally constrained. So there's some indeterminacy there. And then there is the response of the rate of profit to enter your exit. So there's a second source of indeterminacy. So the total indeterminacy that we observe is a result of two sources, right? The, the, inf the informational constraint on the, uh, constraint on the rational individual and then the market response. And in this here, we're not, we're not considering that separation. We're considering a single source of indeterminacy because we have, we believe, no basis to differentiate. Until you do, you don't. I mean, I'm making all sorts of statements of that kind uh, today. Anybody else or should we go home? That was kind of cheating because everybody's going to say, let's go home. <laughs> cool? Thank you. Great. Um, but, 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 Great. Yeah.